Hello, students. You guessed it, Dr. Mink, again. Last time. This is the last lecture of this class. We'll be finishing Chapter 7, uh, covering 7.3, Programming with Arrays, and then 7.4, Multidimensional Arrays, which can be quite um, confusing. So with no further ado, let's get started on these last two sections and finish this class. In section 7.3, we'll talk about some of the problems, issues I should say, when programming with arrays. And at this point in time, we've only learned how to define a static array, which means once it's size is declared, that is its size. It cannot get larger or smaller. So that will provide some challenges for us in programming with arrays. Let's take a closer look. If you want to reuse a program that contains an array, there are some issues that include workarounds. You know, in any program that's going to be reusable, the size needed for an array has to be changeable. Or you might have 20 items one run, and 27 items the next run, and 32 items, and then 15. It, it, it obviously often varies from one of a run of a program to another. And it's, it's usually not known when the program is written how many items will be stored on a specific run. So, a common solution to the size problem with static arrays is to declare the array size to be the largest that could be needed, and then decide how to deal with partially filled arrays. Often, you're going to use arrays that are partially filled. In other words, their capacity is not totally used. You might have an, an, an array of size 100, and it will never ever, you'll never store 100 index variables in those um, locations. So functions dealing with the array may not need to know the declared size of the array, but instead only how many elements are stored in the array during that particular run of the program. So a parameter, you know, let's, for example, number used may be sufficient to assure that the reference index values are legal and or contain valid data for that run. So next we're going to take a look at a function called fill array display 7.9. Let's take a closer look. Here we see the first of three slides which contain Program 7.9. 7.9 is a program that shows the difference between each of a list of golf scores and their average. And it uses a, an integer array. It's declared as score. And it also uses the number used when being passed to the fill array function to determine how many indexed locations in the array are being used with a maximum number allowable. You'll see within the function fill array, there's some local variables, um, most importantly index, which is set to zero, and then is used as the counter while the um, while the array is being filled via CN and when the counter is done index the value of index is assigned a number used which was a call by reference variable so that will be changed back in the main then compute average is passed number used and number used will be uh, used to um, calculate the average. You know how many index variables are contained, have been loaded in via CN 
to um, the array. And also, number used, because it was passed by reference, can be used in the function show difference as its second parameter. Take a close look at this. It's uh, interesting programming and something you should be uh, aware of. Finally, we have a dialog of program 7.9 running. The user um, uh, ends the input with a negative number. And in this particular run, inputs three scores, 69, 74, and 68. And although that array that stores these numbers can hold up to 10 positive numbers, we're only using three. So number used will obviously be three in this particular case. So the average will be calculated by dividing the sum by number used, which is three, and differs from the average. The whole thing is based upon knowing the number of index variable locations in the array that are being used versus the entire or the size, the declared size of the array. This slide discusses the use of constants as arguments versus being used directly as an argument. And the reason you do that is the program becomes much more reusable if the constant exists, is declared at the beginning of the program, and then you just need to change that once, and you're still passing the constant variable as the, the constant uh, the constant variable as a an argument, not the actual value. It's very common to have to search an array to find a specific value, and probably the most common search is a sequential search, which means you look at each element from first to last to see if the target value is equal to any of the array elements. The index of the target value can be returned to indicate where the value was found in the array, or a value of minus one can be returned if the value was not found. The search, funct the search function, which we'll look at in display 7.10, uses a loop to compare array, array elements to the target value, and it sets a variable of type bool to true the target value is found, ending the loop, it checks the Boolean variable when the loop ends to see if the target value is found and returns the index of the target value if found, otherwise minus one. Let's take a look. Here is the first of two slides for program 7.10 from the textbook. You'll see the declaration of the search function that returns an int and it has three parameters. Um, an integer array, which does not get changed, it's set as a constant, the integer number used, and the integer for the target. So it will search through the array um, looking for the target value. And you see the, the code leading up to the call of the function and how it handles the results. Now here's the function definition for the search function. I want you to take a really close look at this. This code is used quite frequently. So we're past an integer array, an integer uh, defining the number used, and the target, which is an integer. We set index to zero and index to zero. We declare a bool found and its initial value is false and while not found an index less than number used, if target equivalent to A sub index found equals true, else index plus plus. This will continue, and if, we, if it's found, we return the index, else we return minus one. This will, and, and, and the index will never be equal to minus one, so that's why they're doing it that way. So, it will loop using a while loop through 
every index value until it finds target equivalent to the index to, to a variable an index variable and that will set found to true very 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 common coding here another very common application that involves array is sorting an array sorting the values stored in an array I create an alphabetical list of list of values in ascending or descending order ascending or descending order um, very very common if you used Excel you've used uh, a variation of this code uh, some algorithms are efficient and some are easier to understand let's take a closer look when the sort is complete the elements of the array the index variables are ordered such that the first is smaller than the second which is smaller than the third this is called ascending order and it leads to an outline of an algorithm and so for and we're going to use a for loop for in index equals zero index less than number used index plus plus place the indexed <laughs> is that really a word indexed smallest element in a for the index so following through on the development of the sort algorithm we are going to go through all the index values search for the smallest value in the array and we'll place that value in index location zero and then we'll place the value that was in index location zero in the location where the smallest was found and then starting at one we'll we'll find the smallest remaining value from one to n well actually one to n minus one and swap with the value currently at one and then starting at two continue the process into the until the array is sorted so the the number of or, or the, the starting point for the sort continues to increment when we place the next smallest in index one we start sorting at two through n minus one and then we place the smallest and found in that set of data in two and then we start sorting at three to n minus one let's take a closer look this slide shows the iterative process of sorting an array we first search from a sub zero to a sub nine and we find two is the smallest value so we swap two out with a value that is in a sub zero and then we search from a sub one to a sub nine find four swap it in into a sub one then we search a sub three all the way up and we continue to shorten the number of items that we're searching through and placing the smallest in the leftmost or the smallest index in that group and eventually we will be left with a group of one to sort and it will be the largest number in the last index location the next two slides show the coded implementation of the sort program and you'll see how it's called in line 26 sort and it's passed an array and a number used and in the next slide you'll see more and a sample dialogue stay tuned although I strongly urge you to pull this program down from web study as a CPP put it in a project code it and um, there are some functions defined in I believe 7.9 .9 and 7.7 .7 that you'd have to pull in and get it to run there's a sample dialogue at the bottom the user enters a uh, up to 10 non-negative whole numbers and uses a sentinel value as a negative number and it sorts those in ascending order that concludes chapter 7.3 and the author challenges you with three tasks you should be able to perform if you've achieved the learning objectives for this chapter he asks you can you write a program that will read up to 10 letters into an array and write the letters back to the screen in the reverse order so ABCD should be output as DCBA 
and use a period as a sentinel value to mark the end of input. So this would be done with cars and um, it should not be that difficult. Hopefully you understood single dimensional arrays, an array of you know simple ints or bools or doubles or whatever. Because now we're going to look at multi-dimensional arrays, which can be thought of as an array of arrays. Think about that for a second before we get started. C++ allows us to have arrays with multiple index values. So for example, here we're declaring an array of characters named page. And page has two index values. The first ranges from 0 to 29, and the second ranges from 0 to 99. Each index is enclosed in its own brackets. So page can be visualized as an array of 30 rows and 100 columns. So if you think about it, the previous example will hold 30 times 100 or 3,000 indexed variables. And they are page 00, page 01, through page 099, and then page 1011 to 199, all the way up to page 290, 291, to page 2999. So page is actually an array of size 30. And page's base type is an array of 100 characters. You may recall that the size of an array is not needed when declaring a formal parameter, such as the void function display, which has a character array and a second parameter that is an integer. However, the base type of a multidimensional array must be completely specified in the parameter declaration. So here's an example of that multidimensional array named page being declared as a parameter in a void function named display page. Some examples of uh, an application for a multidimensional array Imagine a class with four students and three quizzes, pretty small class. Um, and the, the array called grade could be uh, four and three. The first array index refers to the number of students, and the second array index refers to a quiz number. Since student and quiz number start with one, we subtract one to obtain the correct index. The next few slides, um, which are the last slides in this chapter, review um, a program that stores grades. Um, it uses one-dimensional arrays to store each student's average score and each quiz's average score. Function that calculates these averages uses global constants for the size of the arrays. This is be done because the functions seem to be particular to this program. There is some code missing in 7.13 as it comes from the author. And I usually implement this as an in-class project. The code used to fill the array grade is missing. There's a placeholder in between brackets. Um, there it is. You can see at the end of this first slide. And I would like you to uh, because we're finishing this chapter, I would like you to download 7.13 and play with this, add that code. If you're taking this as a hybrid or a traditional class, and I just happen to have posted the video audio lectures, we're going to do this in class. So take a close look at this. This is part two of three slides, and you see the function definition for the computing student average and the computing quiz average. And finally, you see the function definition for display, which sets all the flags for nice, neat output. And you see a sample dialog at the bottom of the slide. Once again, we will do this in class. Last but not least, we see a, a, a diagram that 
shows you how the indexed variable locations are stacked. Student 1, 2, 3, and 4 are in rows, and then the grades for quiz 1, 2, and 3 are in columns, if, if you want to look at it that way. Here the author pre presents an alternate view of the array and how the student averages are calculated across a row and how the quiz averages are calculated down a column. For Excel users, this might make more sense. I know it did to me the first time I looked at this concept in this context. I thought, wow, that's a better way of looking at this than just the index uh, locations. That ends section 7.5 and also chapter 7. I know this was a long chapter. Um, and we are going to do this in one session or one week. So uh, I'm sorry for such a long lecture that has to be completed in one week. But that is the way that I teach this course. We crawled through each chapter two sessions at a time for the first half of the course up until uh, I think chapter six. Chapter five or six was the last one we did that. And now we're going to blow through seven, eight, nine, one week at a time because you have a very rock solid foundation. So the author leaves you with a little brain teaser. Can you write code that will fill the array? Declared below with numbers typed at the keyboard. The numbers will be input five per line on four lines. Give it a shot. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.